This is a video presentation of Bible 2114, Bible Survey, Unit 39, entitled Prophecy and Messianism. As a result of viewing this presentation, the student should be able to define prophet and prophecy, distinguish between the types of prophets, explaining how they differ. Explain reception of the prophetic word. Define the test of the true prophet. Define the basic message of the prophet. Define Messiah and Messianism. And trace the development of Messianism. Our speaker today is Dr. Roy Hayden. When we think of the term prophet, we generally turn our attention to the Bible and think of the unique phenomenon of Israelite prophecy which was unparalleled by any other people or in any other literature in the world. The term prophet, however, has a far greater range and scope than we are at first inclined to admit. Prophecy spans almost 1,000 years of the history of Israel. Men of widely divergent character and various abilities play their parts. Women, too, are recognized in the prophetic movement. There are false prophets mentioned in both the Old and New Testaments. And in the New Testament church, the prophets were second only to the apostles. Prophets have existed in all faiths, in primitive religions, and in the most advanced. They are found in China, Japan, India, among Teutons, Slavs, and Celts, no less than with the Greeks and Romans. Our judgment of them, however, is always determined by how we actually understand the term and how broadly or narrowly we define the concept of prophet. A meteorologist who provides the official forecast of the weather is called a weather prophet. And thus, in the ordinary way of thinking, a prophet is someone who is able to foretell the future. But this is not the case with the Hebrew prophets. The primary preoccupation of the classical biblical prophet is not in foretelling, but forthtelling. The Greek word prophetes, which we have adopted in our own language, denoted the individual who unveils mysteries, acts as the interpreter of the gods, and in particular proclaims the divine oracles. The Hebrew word for prophet is navi, and probably is related to an Akkadian word which means to call. Thus the basic idea behind the Hebrew word for prophet is the one who has been called or the called one. Prophecy is not a phenomenon that is specifically Israelite. Among the Phoenicians there were prophets of Melkart and Baal of Tyre. Balaam the Moabite and Rewasha of Ta'anach are called prophets. In the Egyptian story of Wenamon, the priest of Amun-Re, a message came through one of the young men in a port city who had been seized by the god and prophesied. Prophets are known in Assyria and Mari as well. Ancient man saw in every event the operation of supernatural forces upon which he knew he was dependent. He set himself to discover the purposes of these forces as they affected every sphere of existence and especially his own prospective actions. Examples of this type of activity are numerous in the Old Testament. In 1 Samuel 9, 6, Saul consults Samuel the prophet, who had formerly been called a seer, to find out where his father's lost asses were. When David sought to know the probable conduct of the men of Keilah, when he was trying to avoid death at the hands of Saul, he consulted the priest. In 2 Kings 1, 2, 
Ahaziah tried to consult the Philistine divinity at Ekron to find out if he would recover from his fall from the second story balcony. Zedekiah, the last king of Judah, consulted Jeremiah to know what the word of the Lord was for him. Finally, in Ezekiel 8, 1, 14, 1, and 21, the elders of Judah in exile in Babylon consult Ezekiel to learn the will of God for them. At first, the priest seems to have been the medium for this type of information, and the answers were received by asking questions that could be answered by yes or no. The Urim and Thummim played a large part in this type of inquiry. There is, however, a surprising scarcity of references to this type of oracle. Much more frequently, and at various epochs in the history of Israel, it was the man of God who consulted Yahweh. Examples of early men of God are Samuel, Ahijah from Shiloh, who told Jeroboam he would be king over ten of the tribes, Shemaiah, who informed Rehoboam that the division of the kingdom was the will of God, and warned Rehoboam against going to war with Jeroboam, and then Elijah and Elisha. There are also men of God who are nameless. The type of oracle these men received could be termed an inspirational oracle, as opposed to the cultic oracle associated with the priests and shrines. Certain characteristics of these men of God set them apart from other men. He often is aware of the divine will and purpose beforehand. Ahijah, though blind physically, saw through the disguise of the wife of Jeroboam. The word with which the man of God is charged was often severe. His word was not his own. It was, thus Yahweh says. There can be no distinction made between the prophet and the man of God. The word of God was received by the prophet or man of God in several ways. Most often the process is described as the word of Yahweh came to the prophet. The fact of its reception is held to be so self-evident that no further explanation of the how is required. We know that on the occasion just prior to Saul's death, he could receive no answer from Yahweh, though he tried dreams, Urim, and prophets. Jeremiah, on one occasion, waited ten days for the word from the Lord. On the other hand, it would appear that the word of Yahweh is not always restricted to the prophets. When Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, warned Josiah about going to war with him, the Bible says, Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn away from him, but disguised himself in order to fight with him. He did not listen to the words of Necho from the mouth of God, but joined battle in the plain of Megiddo. And in 2 Kings 18.25, the Rabshakeh, the Assyrian spokesman, says, Moreover, is it without the Lord that I have gone up against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, Go up against this land and destroy it. Another way in which the word of the Lord came to the prophet is described as the spirit of Yahweh came upon the prophet. This is the same terminology as used in the accounts of the spirit-filled leaders and judges. Elisha prayed that the spirit of Yahweh that informed Elijah be bestowed on him, and a sign was given that his petition had been granted. The spirit, however, is not always to be trusted. Yahweh can put a lying spirit into the mouth of the prophets, as was the case in 1 Kings 22.22. The Lord wanted to know in the heavenly council who would entice Ahab that he would go to war and be killed. A spirit came forward and said he would, 
the Lord said to him, By what means? And he said, I will go forth and will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, You are to entice him, and you shall succeed. Go forth and do so. Of course, this is an extraordinary event and is the exception to the spirit of Yahweh coming upon his messenger. As a consequence of the coming of the spirit of Yahweh on the person, there was a shattering upheaval in his inner life and often a complete transformation of his personality. A third way in which the coming of the Word of God is described is in terms of Yahweh's hand coming or falling upon the prophet. This is found chiefly in Ezekiel. There is no indication as to how the communication of the Word of Yahweh is to be understood. The reception of the Word cannot be rationalized. In the final analysis, the prophets are extraordinary individuals whose words and actions are not to be measured by ordinary standards. The prophet's call belongs to the realm of extraordinary experience. Earlier, it was suggested that the Hebrew word for prophet is related to the idea of the man who is called. For most of the prophets, the call came in the course of a vision. The most vivid example of this is Isaiah. Other prophets lay more stress upon Yahweh's decisive and inescapable intervention in the life of a man. However the call came, the prophet was convinced that he had been commissioned by God for his task, and this call was an essential ingredient in the ministry of the prophet. In the Bible, there is often a tension between prophets. There are the cultic prophets who generally pursued their ministry at the central uh, sanctuaries of the cult. They had officially accredited positions, and probably the prophets mentioned earlier upon whom the lying spirit came were of this type. Sometimes they are called false prophets who pretend to proclaim Yahweh's word. The designation false prophet may not be a good term since these prophets were convinced that they were commissioned by Yahweh and believed they were proclaiming his word. The only criterion of judgment given in Scripture by which a prophet or prophecy can be evaluated is when a prophet speaks in the name of Yahweh, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word which Yahweh has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Examples of this are found in the Bible. In 1 Kings 22:28, Micaiah the prophet said, this was said to Ahab, if you return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And Ezekiel told the people to whom he ministered, when this comes, and come it will, then they will know that a prophet has been among them. And Habakkuk is told by Yahweh, write the vision, make it plain upon tablets, so he may run who reads it, for still the vision awaits its time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. The message of the prophet was, of course, directly related to the will of God for the people. This was usually connected with two great th uh, themes which ran through Jewish history, promise and law. It was these two themes that the prophets sought to develop, the promise, the messianic hope, the theocratic destiny of mankind, and then to realize the law the condition and ethical element of all theocratic life and of all love communion with God. Their message in relation to the promise differed from the priests. The priests symbolized the promised salvation by their acts, 
the prophets by their words. The priests entered by the blood of atonement into the fellowship of love with God, the prophets by the indwelling spirit. In the ministry of Christ, his teaching and his death, both of these elements are included. Not only did he act, but the interpretation of that act was in the message he gave to his disciples. Several inferences may be drawn from the fact that the prophet was concerned with the promise and the law. First, since the chief activity of the prophets was directed towards realizing the theocratic union of man and God, and since this union was a moral relation, a communion of love within an element of holiness, the prophet himself had to be a holy man. Secondly, as it was holy men who spoke, and as their speaking was directed to holy ends, so their means were holy. The men were moral, their ends were moral, and the means employed were the usual moral means. A third inference is that their prophecy is linked to the history of the church. Since the Old Testament concept of people of God expressed in the nation of Israel is taken over by the people of God expressed in the church, it is logical to assume that what the prophet said was directly related to the church. And the fourth inference is that a moral being is never a machine. The prophets uttered truths which had taken hold of their own souls, proclaimed hopes which swelled their own hearts, and pointed the eyes of their countrymen to glorious visions of a day, the dawning of which they themselves had already seen. The prophets were concerned with the union of man with God. This is the result of historical action along two lines. Along one, God descends until he becomes man. We call this the Incarnation. Along the other, man is raised up until he is capable of receiving God. This we call redemption or salvation. The prophets were the interpreters of this action of God. Three distinct steps may be observed in God's method of revelation. Sometimes he teaches exclusively by acts, with no accompanying word of explanation. Sometimes there are the great divine manifestations or acts, but these usually are preceded by some event or interpretation, a word of revelation which explains it. This is the stage during the period of the great prophets. And the third step is found in the New Testament where truth is taught to a certain extent apart from occurrence or event as principles. Most of the epistles are a part of this third step. One of the important subjects discussed and developed by the prophets was the Messiah and Messianism. Joseph Klausner defines a belief in the Messiah as the prophetic hope for the end of this age in which a strong Redeemer by his power and his spirit will bring complete redemption, political and spiritual, to the people of Israel. And along with this, earthly bliss and moral perfection to the entire human race. The term Messiah occurs about 70 times in the Old Testament, but is never used in the sense of an eschatological figure. Generally, it simply means an anointed one. This anointed one may be a king, a priest, or a prophet. During the intertestamental period, the term developed into a technical term. It became the accepted title for a specific redeemer. In the New Testament, the Greek term Christos is used. Since it is the exact equivalent for Messiah, it too was an accepted title or proper name. So that you may have some idea of the development of Messianism, 
Here is offered, with some hesitation, a very oversimplified sketch. At the root, there is an implicit faith that God has entered into a covenant with Israel, and that this covenant God, Yahweh, is the true king. With the rise of the Israelite monarchy, the elements of this basic faith were rather explicitly attached to the king. He was the anointed one. According to 1 Kings 19.16, and at times, he is pictured also as a priest. He was a sacred person who could be addressed as Elohim and God's son. But experience proved also that he was a human being, and as such he could become in varying degrees wicked and corrupt. The kingdom accordingly suffered serious defection from the ideal of righteousness. The next step seems to have been the expression of a hope that there would be, perhaps in the king's son, a brighter tomorrow, when the kingdom would be restored to the ideal. So far, this is non-eschatological. This means that all of this would work its way out from the normal course of history. Since that brighter tomorrow never came, the hope was transferred to the Lord Yahweh, and with that event, whenever it happened, the eschatological type of messianism came into being. This meant that God himself would step in and bring the kingdom. This eschatological messianism seems to have developed in two ways. According to one, the ideal kingdom would be realized only through a heavenly being who came to be known as the Son of Man. When Jesus called himself Son of Man in the New Testament, he was referring to this divine being mentioned by Daniel. He did not use the term as Ezekiel used it to mean merely human being. Historical events were continually bringing about changes in the various elements of the belief in the Messiah. Klausner put it this way, in those periods in which the people Israel was still living an independent political life in its own land, ethical perfection and earthly bliss were more emphasized. But in the period of subjugation and exile, the yearning for political freedom took first place. In times of national freedom, the worldwide universalistic part of the messianic hopes was the basic element in the messianic idea. But in times of trouble and distress for the people of Israel, the nationalistic element was stressed much more. Now, Klausner attacked Christianity because it tried to remove the political and nationalistic element. The Messiah was not completely spiritual. He was both spiritual and political at the same time. However, this is not a valid criticism by Klausner, because most Christians still allow the political aspect in the belief in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. The prophets contributed much to the concept of the Messiah. Micah 5.2 speaks of Bethlehem as the place from which the Messiah would come. And this is interpreted by the New Testament as a prediction of the birth of Jesus there. Isaiah was using extensive passages dealing with different aspects of the Messiah. Chapter 11 has been called the most exalted description of the Messiah in the prophets. Perhaps the greatest contribution of this prophet, however, is the concept of the servant of the Lord. Sometimes a servant seems to be the people of Israel who suffer on behalf of others. At other times it is an individual, perhaps the prophet himself or some other. Christians, of course, saw in them a reference to Jesus. The servant song in chapters 52, 53 is hard to interpret in any other way than as a direct reference 
to Jesus and his suffering. For the Christian, Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. He was anointed at his baptism by the Holy Spirit. Jesus seldom used the term of himself, however, probably because of the misunderstanding that would be caused by its use. And Jesus understood and fulfilled his messianic vocation in a different way from that popularly associated with the expected Messiah. F.F. F. Bruce says that the Messiahship of Jesus was to be realized in terms of the portrayal of the servant, humble, obedient, suffering, accomplishing his mission by passing through death and committing his vindication confidently to God. His ministry crowned by his passion was characterized by steadfast adherence to the path thus marked out for him by his Father. And in consequence, Jesus has given to the word Messiah a new meaning, transcending every connotation which it previously bore. In this unit, we have discussed something of the prophet and his work. The prophet is a spokesman for God, who because of his divine call, must proclaim God's message to the people. Prophecy is basically forth-telling and is only incidentally predictive. The prophets received their message from God, but described this reception in several different ways. The test of a true prophet is whether what he has said actualizes. The message of the prophet is concerned with the promise and the law. Included in the promise is the concept which is more fully developed as the Messiah, a strong redeemer who by his power and spirit will bring complete redemption, both politically and spiritually, to the people of Israel. This has been a video presentation of Bible Survey, Unit 39, entitled Prophecy and Messianism. This program was produced by the Department of Educational Media of Oral Roberts University.